All right. Uh, we're going to come back to John 1 in a minute, but look over at the very end of the book to uh, chapter 20. I think I mentioned this. Uh, it might have been last week. I'm not sure, but I mentioned this, and I couldn't remember exactly where it was. I got it confused for a minute with the very last verse of John that talks about how Jesus did very... He did many other things. He said, he said if, the, if the world couldn't contain all the books, it was the kind of the verbiage that he used there. But in John chapter 20, he ends, uh, he ends it like this. He says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Verse 31, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And it's very much like first uh first John 5 13, where he says, you know, these things have I written to you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And what you get the idea is that John is basically preaching a book about about how to be saved. I mean, this is like a gospel tract according to John. I mean, that's uh, that's kind of like a big uh, tract that people you could use to get somebody saved. And so the whole thing, you know, as we're talking about this series is soul winning verses that we, you know, that we use in trying to present the gospel to somebody. Uh, and then we're just looking at the context of those verses instead of just uh, just using the verses like we normally do in a quick presentation. But we want to see exactly what the Bible has to say about these things and why uh, those verses exist. And so the idea was to go through the context of all of these. But John, it, I mean, it's like you could literally go through the whole book of John and just break it down and use that to preach the gospel. So when you look at John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I just remembered something I wanted to write down here real quick. <clears throat> All right, I will forget if I don't write it down. So, uh, so this whole book, besides just being a great uh, you know, way to show the gospel and to show people how, how to go to heaven. Jesus, of course, being the only way. This whole book is full of, of doctrine. I mean, just this first section that he read here is full of doctrine. Think about it. Uh, the Word was God. That's a, that's a major doctrine about the deity of, of Christ and how He's not just the Son of God. He's not just a prophet of God or something like that, but He is God. It says the Word was God. Uh, it talks about the eternality of Christ. It's not like, you know, all of a sudden Jesus existed, but he's always been. It says, in the beginning was uh, the Word. And so, uh, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, the eternality of Christ. It talks about how Christ is the Creator. It's not just like, you know, we talk about God speaking the world into existence, and then later on we see the, the person of, of Christ. But no, the Bible says that he was there in creation. He was part of creation. He was the one who, who did the work. A few different verses in the Bible talk about that. Uh, and it's right there. It says, all things were made by him. Uh, it talks about the incarnation of Christ, how he became a man. It says the word was made flesh. Okay, so that which is spiritual, uh, that existed forever, that is God, became flesh. It took on the form of a human being. And of course, we know that I just celebrated that in, uh, in December. All right, then it talks about the saving power of, of Christ. Okay, that would be our uh, soteriology. I mean, uh, yeah, soteriology, like how to be saved. Jesus Christ says, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So, of course, when you get in, you know, start with chapter one, this is just an introduction to the whole book. And so it's, it's actually introducing John, not their author of this book, but John the Baptist, who was preaching and, uh, and proclaiming that Jesus was coming, that the Messiah was coming. And so it introduces it in an interesting way where it talks about the Word, how the Word existed in the beginning and all this, and then it's going to say that John was not that light, but was there to proclaim uh, that light. So, uh, you know, so this is... A great book, one that we recommend people to read. You know, oftentimes, if you can only recommend 
a book or two books, what are the two that we always recommend? John and Romans, right? We've got a whole bunch of John and Romans sometimes that we give out, soul winning, or a lot of missionaries will print off a bunch of John and Romans because you can fit, you know, fit that all in a pretty small booklet. And it's the Word of God, but it's just like two books that kind of give some of the most important doctrines and the most important uh, thoughts. So this is a very good book. Now, I tend to use this verse in my soul winning presentation which my soul winning presentation isn't always exactly the same, that's for sure. But, uh, but ideally, if I'm writing out the presentation, like this is the presentation to give, I'm probably going to put in John 1, 12, where it, when it comes to the point of, well, how do you receive the gift? Okay, because here's basically what we've done so far. And we've looked at these verses. Uh, we've talked about Romans 3.23. We know that everybody's a sinner. This is when we give a gospel presentation. We need them to know, hey, you're a sinner. You think you're good enough to go to heaven. You think God's going to be happy with your works. But at the end of the day, we're all sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We talked about that. We talked about how uh, because of our sins, we deserve eternal damnation. Romans uh, 6, 23, wages of sin is death. And then we also mentioned Isaiah 64, 6, that says even our righteousness is a, as our filthy rag. So if you try to impress God with your righteousness, that doesn't really mean anything to him. Like, yes, he wants us to do good and, and he can appreciate our efforts and all that. But really, compared to his holiness and his goodness, there's nothing we could do that would merit something, especially our salvation. We can't earn that. And so uh, we looked at Ephesians 2, 8, 9 and, and uh, all these things that showed that it's not by our works, but it's a free gift of God. <clears throat> John three sixteen, we talked about that free gift. Uh, the gospel in a nutshell right there, the gospel in one verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we've made this case that salvation is a free gift of God, and it's not something that we can earn. So now we have to find out, well, how do I receive that gift then? I mean, because where is it? How do I, how do I grab it? It's something spiritual, obviously. So how do I grab that gift? And so I'll oftentimes start by saying John 1, uh, 12 but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So however you, it is that you receive him, and, I get, and then I'm about to show them in my presentation how to receive him. However it is that you receive him, you know, now you have the power to become the son of God. And that's what salvation is. You're, you're, you're born again and made a new creature, which we'll talk about here in this lesson. So what we want to do is look at that in the context. Okay, so not just... Uh, John 1, 12, and talk about that. But we want to look at this whole verse and how this fits in and what that means. And if you look at this whole context, what it's revealing about Jesus, even though a lot of this has to do with leading up to John, talking about John the Baptist, um, you know, it, it starts with Jesus and then John the Baptist is proclaiming Jesus. And so really the whole, uh, the whole book is about Jesus. So, so here's a few things that I want to show you in this lesson that the uh, Bible says in this ver in this chapter about uh, Jesus. Number one, and this is gonna, I did a little bit of I I I alliterating this time, or not alliterating, but whatever it's called, where they all start with the same letter. <laughs> Number one uh, is communication, okay, and that is the Word. Jesus is called the Word, and I'm going to explain uh, some of these things as I go by. What is a word for it? communication? So Jesus, as the word, as, as the word, the word of God, and the C word that I want you to remember is communication. Look at verse one again. It says, "In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God." Look at verse fourteen, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of uh, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. In truth. Now turn over, keep your place in John, but turn, turn over to uh, 1 John. Of course, this is the same author uh, who writes three more letters here later on. 1 John. And also chapter 1, verse 1. So here, here's how he starts out this other letter. He started as the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 1 John, he starts this letter off by saying, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eye, with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Okay, so same 
vernacular. He's talking about the same thing, you know, from the beginning. And then he talks about this word and we've handled him. So, you know, the word be, it, it became flesh. All this is uh, implied here. So what is a word? Maybe. Now, something that we bring up a lot, and I don't think it's wrong to say this. You might have to explain it a little bit so people don't think you're weird. But this right here is also the word of God. Right. So if why would we call Jesus the word and this the word? Now, this in and of itself, these pages, right, this leather bound, bound Bible, whatever, all this is just it's, it's a book. Now, I remember and some people still have this feeling. That's fine. I understand what you're what you're thinking because you're like, hey, this imply. I mean, this represents the word of God. And so you need to take care of it. I remember growing up, you didn't ever put it on the floor because I had a bad habit of just laying my books on the floor, like during the preaching or whatever. And people say, no, 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 you don't put that on the floor. This is the word of God. Well, actually, this is just a book. This is a leather bound cover. There's some notes in here uh, that aren't even the word of God. They're just notes. This is pen and ink and, and, uh, and paper. Okay. So this in and of itself, because here's another problem. How many have a hard time throwing a Bible away? Like when I'm done reading it and its pages are torn, like I've had this Thessalonians is, has been falling out of my Bible for a long time, but I'm like, I can't throw this away. I could probably patch that up or something, you know, uh, the rest of it's still good. But at some point, your Bible is no good and, it's <laughs> and it needs to be it needs to be tossed. You know, some people are like, no, we'll give it a proper burial at sea or we'll light it on fire. Or we'll do whatever. You know, it's just it's just a book. The word of God is what these words are expressing. Here's another thing. If, if you have the word of God, you got a copy at home and it sits on your shelf, but you never read it. It's not really the word of God. It's just a book that sits on your shelf. Right. Those words, though, what it means when you read it, what it says to you. Uh, what it what it represents. I mean, that's what we mean by the word of God. So when we call Jesus the word of God, and especially if you're thinking like, well, this is the word of God and Jesus is the word of God. So this is Jesus. Well, those words talk about Jesus because the interesting, everything in the whole Bible from beginning to end is, is the gospel of Jesus in a way. It's telling the story of Jesus. It talks about the fall of man and why we need, even needed Jesus to come. It talks about uh, the laws and how nobody could follow the laws. Uh, it all, all the pictures in there talking about Jesus, uh, depicting Jesus. And then Jesus comes. we got four accounts of the gospel so we can get a good full view of the things that happened. And then we got the book of Acts where they're proclaiming that gospel all the way up to Revelation when Jesus comes back again. This is... The word of God. I mean, this is this is the expression that God wants to give us concerning his son. And uh, and so it makes sense that this would be called the word. And Jesus is the word because that's what G God is expressing to us. OK, so what do we mean by Jesus being a word? Now, a word is something that is typically written down, but not necessarily. If I just had the whole Bible memorized, which you heard me trying to quote <laughs> <laughs> one verse. And so that's going to be difficult. But some people can memorize large portions of scripture and keep that memorized. Uh, I've heard of people in China, for instance, who aren't allowed to have a Bible or else they'll get thrown in jail, have smuggled little portions of the Bible where they can read it and study it. And then they pass that on to somebody else and, so that they can retain it in their mind. And they're like, hey, you can, you know, you can ban me from having the Bible in my hand, but you can't get it out of my head whenever I remember it. OK, so it's not just written words. Sometimes people can just speak it to each other. You know, what if you don't have a mouth? <laughs> you know, so our, our guys next door, they sign to each other because they can't hear. And uh, and so, you know, there are lots of ways of expressing words. Uh, anyone that has children, I know Viviana is at this point where she's learning how to uh, express herself with a very limited vocabulary. So like everything she says at first, it all sounds the same. Dada can mean a lot of things. It's not just dada, uh, you know, die, die could be diaper or it could be bye bye. <laughs> so like she's got a very limited vocabulary. She learns how to how to communicate. She learned. uh Oh, she understands the principle of uh oh, you know, she learned the principle of ouch, something hurts. Right. So when her tooth was hurting, she was like rubbing her tooth and she said, ouch, and she's communicating us with a very limited vocabulary. But we know what she's saying. 
She got that word across. She got that expression across. And so however it is that God communicates with us, that's the word of God. All throughout the Old Testament, this is bothering me. I got to pick it up. All throughout the Old Testament, when a prophet spoke the word of God, you know, or he, let's just say this, when he received the word of God, it was most likely an audible voice. Maybe nobody else heard it, but God was speaking to him. So he received the word of God. Then he wrote it down. It's still the word of God when it's written down. And then somebody else reads it to somebody else. It's still the word of God, you know, and then if you memorize it and you got it in your, it's the word of God. You get what I'm saying? The word of God is you got to think outside of just pages, but you got to think it's the expression that God has to, uh, to mankind. And an interesting thought that I always uh, contemplate about the Trinity, you know, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, which, which John says, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, uh, you know, and we talk about how the Word is God, okay? Now, it gets the Trinity is a hard one to understand. Uh, there are three persons, one God, but three persons, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. These three are one, and yet, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit. They have certain uh, distinct uh, uh, person, personalities. However, you know, one of the ways I try to explain it is in a, in a recorded message on a voice recording. If uh, I think a lot of people still use these. I know now, like if you call someone, it leaves a voicemail, it just says, you have reached blah, 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 blah. And it's not really the person that you're calling. But if you were to call me, I believe it's still there. I would have a voice record. You have reached, you know, Rocky's phone. I'm not here, whatever it says. And that's my voice. And so you would say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm listening to Rocky. That's Rocky. That, and somebody else might say, no, 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 that's a recording of Rocky. Or someone else would say, no, that's not Rocky. That's his voice. But at the end of the day, it's, it's all the same. It's, you know what I mean? It's all, it's all me. And I think maybe you can kind of, every illustration falls short of explaining the Trinity. But you can kind of understand that, you know, there's one God, but there's different persons. Okay. So not even like different parts of the same God, but different distinct persons. All right. You, this isn't about the Trinity. So let's move on. But, yeah, but the communication, the part that I want to bring out about the word is that that is the expression of God. I want to give you some, uh, some other thoughts here. Uh, God speaks. Look at, look at Roman, Romans 2. I'll read 2 Corinthians 3. It says, Ye are our epistle and in our heart. And so Paul is talking there to the church of, uh, of Corinth, and he's saying, you know, when you go about preaching what we told you to preach and you go preach it to somebody else, you are an epistles, you know, written on, uh, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. So when people like watch them and they talk about them, it's like that is an expression of the work that Paul's done, which is an expression also of what God done. But he's calling them an epistle, uh, you know, in, in this. It's kind of the same way when we do something that carries out what God meant for us to do, then we are we are being we are communicating that as well to him. So look at Romans chapter 2, verse 15. I thought I made it. 2, 15 says, uh, well, let's back up. For when the Gentiles, verse 14, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. So not only is uh, the word written and, you know, communicated, you know, written in, in, uh, on the pages and communicated by speech and all that, but sometimes it's even written on the heart. Like a man knows in his conscience to do certain things or to not do certain things, even if he hasn't read that. It's just he knows it. he has this moral uh, uh, conscience inside. And I think that's the idea about that verse. So how is Jesus the word then? We're talking about expression and communication and all that. How is Jesus the word? Well, Hebrews chapter 1, 3. Hebrews 1, 3 says. Talking about Jesus, it says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, 
when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So it's talking about Jesus and it says that he's the brightness of his, of his glory, of the glory of God and the express image of his person. Okay. And so uh, he is, that's another way of saying he's the word. He's that express image. He's that communicate, uh, that communication. The Bible says that um, no man has seen God. Uh, now you could say, well, Moses got to see the backside of his glory. You know, uh, people have seen God. God spoke to Moses, you know, face to face. Uh, and there's other places in the Bible you can say, well, it seems like they saw God. No, they saw what God showed them, which was only a communication and expression. And so uh, it gets kind of confusing, but some people call them theophanies or Christophanies where it says that they saw like the pre-incarnate Christ before he was flesh on earth in the Old Testament. And they saw these visions and it was actually Christ, a manifestation, you know, for them to see. Like, I don't know how, to, how deep to get into some of that, but here is the thing that God communicated through various means, but nobody actually saw God the Father. Okay, God the Father, and I can't explain, I can't explain this entirely, okay, but I'm going to try to explain it this way. God the Father, the Bible says, is spirit, right? He's spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Uh, you know, it says, no man has seen the Father. Think about this. If God is everywhere present, how could you ever see him? Unless you're everywhere present, <laughs> you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a spirit and man cannot see God. So all we can see is an expression of God. It doesn't mean... You know, he's not a, a, a living, thinking person. Obviously, we're made in his image. But remember also that his image is his Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so, uh, and so I believe that that has to do with the fact that we are both, we are body, we are mind, we are spirit. And so uh, I think that's, a, man, I'm just really confusing with the, with, I didn't mean to get into the, the, the Trinity so, so much today. Okay, but here's the thing. No man has seen God. And so the Bible says, look at John 1, 18. We'll just read that. We are, that's part of our text anyway. John 1, 18. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So see, he's that express image of God. And he's declaring God and he is uh, being the mouthpiece of God and, the, and communicating uh, to us God's will and all. So number one, the Bible says that he is the word. All right. <clears throat> Which, what was the C word? Anybody remember? Communication. That's what a word's for, communication. Okay, number two, the Bible says that he is the life. Okay, look at verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Look at, uh, now go back over to 1 John. Again, same author, so he's using a lot of the same terminology, same thoughts. And look at 1 John 5, starting in verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So let me ask you this. Can a person, can a person who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ ever have life? No, you've got to have the Son. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. This is why it would be ridiculous for someone to say, well, what about, what about the Jews? Jews are God's chosen people. Don't they just get a free pass into heaven? Not if they rejected Jesus. You know, that's a whole other subject that we could talk about. But the fact is, they can say, well, they serve the same God. No, they don't serve the, they don't serve the same God. Because if they rejected the, the Son, then they don't have the Father. And the Bible is very clear about this. And so you have to have the Son to have life. Therefore, if you don't have the Son, what do you have? The opposite of life, death. Right, you have uh, you have death. Death has come upon all men. We'll talk about that here in a second. The Bible says, in fact, Romans five. <clears throat> Let 
Romans 5. In verse 12, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. That's talking about Adam uh, through his sin, you know, and then all of his uh, offspring after that, you know, all have sinned. The Bible says so by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. OK, so death passed upon all men because all have sinned. So all of us are sinners. And therefore, we are dead spiritually. And so when we talk about Jesus being the life, the only hope for a dead person to be resurrected, the only hope for a dead person to be able to go to heaven is that they have to be regenerated. They have to be quickened, the Bible says, and given that life, which is through Jesus Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. So you have to have uh, the Son. So the C word for this one is creation. Okay, communication, creation. Life has to do, this new life, this new birth has to do with creation or recreation, you could even say, in a, in a sense. Uh, Ephesians 2, 5 says, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved. All part of the grace of God that we might have life through Jesus Christ. He's given us life. He's quickened us when we, while we were dead in our sins. All right. So it is the new life that, that we need. Obviously we're living souls in, in a manner of speaking, we're walking around, we're talking, we have life, we're breathing, we're conscious of, of, of our existence and all that kind of stuff. We have life, but spiritually we're dead. And so the opposite happens when a person finds Christ. Now, spiritually, they have life, but in this, in this flesh, it's dead. Now, obviously, we still are, again, walking, living, breathing, and all that, but we live in Christ, and we're dead to the old man. At least we should be. Now, oftentimes, as we're dragging this body around, we feed the flesh, and we continue to live in sin, uh, but the real loss... I won't take time to give Paul's uh, dissertation on this, but Paul says, you know, if I sin, it's not me that sins, but it's the sin that's in my flesh, right? Because this flesh is sinful. It's corrupt. It's got to, go, it's got to die and be buried in the ground. It doesn't get to go to heaven, all right? Well, the only thing, uh, part of us that gets uh, physically goes to heaven is when we get a glorified body one day because that which is spirit is spirit. That which is flesh is flesh. Flesh is already, uh, the flesh is already corruptible, okay? It's already... Because, because what did he say? Uh, all, you know, death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. You got to die. But spiritually, you can be alive forevermore if you have the son. That's what he's saying. So, so not only is he the, uh, the word or the, create, or the uh, communication of God, but he's life. Okay, he's the, he's the creator. He's the he, he creation. Not only did he... You know, here's another interesting thing about the about the word word. OK, when you read in Genesis one, uh, when God spoke everything into existence, he said, let there be light. And there was light. Right. It says uh, elsewhere in the Bible, it talks about Jesus being the one, you know, by him, all things consist. And, uh, and, and by him were all things made, the Bible says. And so Jesus being the word of God was the instrumental part of everything that's created. You know, how hard was he working? Was he sweating? Whatever. No, it, it, it happened just like that. <laughs> you know, and it didn't need six days. He could have done it in the blink of, he could have done it all in the blink of an eye. But Jesus was part of that because Jesus is, is he's the word of God. So he's not only the, uh, the communication, but he's also the creation or the creator, I should say, uh, who gives life. And then number three, he's the light. All right, back to John 1. And then you guessed it, we'll be going to 1 John again in a minute. John 1, <clears throat> anybody want to take a guess at the C? Communication, creation, what would light be? Comprehension. Look at verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, 
and the darkness comprehended it not. And then uh, look at, uh, well, let's just keep reading. This, uh, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, talking about John the Baptist. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. There's another evidence where he made all things. And the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. Then this is our verse. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now what do we mean by comprehension? Okay, the Bible says that he is light. God is light. In him is no darkness. Go to 1 John. I told you we'd go there. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. First John 1 John 1.5 This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And then he goes on, If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. The Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have not in us, we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and the Word is not in us. So obviously we've all sinned, but this is going further because here He's talking to saved people. It begins by uh, talking about uh, you know, the fact that He is uh, uh, you know, He's wanting us to have fellowship with Him and our fellowship is with the Son, Jesus Christ. And so uh, we know that the context here, He's He's talking to save people. And so he's saying, you are saved. And so you have the light. So you need to continue in that light in, in the father. You know, he says he is light and in him is no darkness. All right. So when we say we are walking in the light, but we live, we're living in darkness. He's saying you're, you're really not walking in the light. He's not saying you're not saved. He's just saying that you're not, you're not living like you're supposed to. Remember, Jesus said that we're supposed to be a light to the world. He says, you are the light of the world. Uh, uh, and then he says, a, a candle, you, you know, you wouldn't hide a candle under a bushel because then nobody could see it, but you'd, you, you would hold, hold it up so, so all could see, I'm paraphrasing. And so, uh, you know, uh, we are supp supposed to be the light of the world. And what we're supposed to be doing as the light of the world is communicating Christ to the world. Okay, so he's the light and we're supposed to be shining that light to the world. Now, what do I mean by comprehension? Okay, well, if you think about it, John 1 said that the darkness comprehended him not. Now, can darkness actually comprehend light? Can, let's, put, let's ask this question. Can, can darkness overtake light? Let's say you have, let's say you have a, a candle going. Now, a wind could blow the candle out. But is it ever possible situation you say, man, it's just so dark in here that it put the light out? <laughs> That's not how light works, right? Darkness can't overtake the light. The light will always overtake the darkness, right? It's, light is the absence of darkness. And so, or darkness is the absence of light. <laughs> so can, the, uh, can darkness actually overtake the light? No. It can't even actually reject light. There's no way that it can reject light. There has to be like a barrier there. So here is the, here is the vernacular the Bible uses a lot of times. The Bible says that those who are dead in their trespasses of sins, those who are on their way to hell, basically, okay, because the, the, they, they, have not, they don't have Christ. It says that they are in spiritual darkness. Okay, they are in blindness. Okay, so if you were to close your eyes right now, you'd be in total darkness. Now, even though the light's on, you wouldn't see it because your eyes are closed. So this is the only way I can see in my mind that somebody could be in darkness and not have the light, you know, overtake them. You know, they would have to reject that light. How do you reject that light? Well, you would have to have some kind of barrier to block from seeing that light. And so when the world, when the world being in blindness, 
Now, sometimes it says that God had blinded the eyes of men because they rejected Christ. They didn't have faith. And so they will never comprehend the things of God. The Bible says that, uh, that the things of God are, are spiritual. Okay, And those who are carnal can never comprehend those. That's why the foolishness, uh, God chose the foolishness of preaching. To the world, the things that we get up and preach, that's foolishness. What are you talking about? God's light. What are you talking about? I mean, all this stuff is just foolishness. What are you talking about? Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's just all foolishness. No, actually, God says that the foolishness, I mean, the, that the wisdom of man is foolishness to God. And so what we need to be concerned about is what is the truth of God. And as we see that and as we open up our eyes, the Bible uses another word, enlightened. Somebody who is enlightened. Now, look, we'll never have it all figured out. You know, we all, we'll always see through a glass darkly until we stand face to face with God. And then all the, all the questions are answered. But about the basic spiritual things about salvation, you know, basic spiritual things about living for God, understanding His goodness and, and, uh, and, and how to love others, all those kinds of things come from being enlightened whenever somebody receives Jesus Christ. And then uh, they receive that word. Okay, so the Bible says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So you hear the Word of God preached to you, the Holy Spirit, or that life that is in uh, that Word, it's a living Word, that life then pricks the heart and does the convicting power once the Gospel's preached. And then once that, that convicting power gets to that person, then if they'll open their eyes and receive that, they're enlightened. Okay, it doesn't mean, again, that they have all the answers, but all of a sudden there's a spiritual understanding. I'm going to tell you this, all the soul winners in here, if you've ever knocked on the door and tried to preach the gospel to some people, there are times where it's hard to tell if a person actually got saved or not. But then there are other times where you're just like, that person got it, because you could just see it in their eyes. They just, all of a sudden, they were enlightened, and you're just like, ah, I get it. And they receive that, and they're happy about it, and it's just like, you know, their life might not radically change, and everything's different from that day forward, but in their heart and in their minds, they get it. There's an enlightenment. The light went off. Okay, you could say it that way. And so, uh, and so they open up their eyes, and all of a sudden, you can see this spiritual awakening where they understood my salvation is not based on my own works. My salvation is based on the Jesus righteousness. And he gave himself, he became sin for all, uh, for all the world. All we got to do is put our faith in him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And whenever he, we do that, then he gives us life in the inner man. Okay, this body will still die, but the inner man will live on. So, in conclusion, I want to just... Uh, Say, of course, I mentioned that the Gospel of John is pretty much uh, just a, a whole gospel tract. I mean, it's, it's all talking about Jesus and showing how anyone that believeth in him uh, shall not perish but have everlasting life. And it starts out, it makes sense that the very first verse would just be full of showing the way of salvation. So, you know, how do you receive that salvation then? You know, whosoever, uh, I mean, uh, what does it say that, um, how do they say, those, uh, whoever receiveth him, uh, my mind just went blank. Romans one twelve. somebody started for me. But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. Okay, so how do you receive that? Well, it makes it very clear in the book of John over and over. We already read John 3.16 last week. You've got to believe. You've got to have faith and then let God do the rest. Because our salvation is through His grace, you know. But through faith, we just receive that and then He begins to open up the eyes. He begins to open up the mind. He begins to teach us things and show us things. He begins to give us life inside. And the Bible says that His Spirit, His spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. I mean, if you believe in Him and you trust in Him and you understand His Word, then when you hear it, you're just like, ah, that makes sense. I understand that. You know, uh, and when you ask yourself, like, am I saved or am I not saved? You're just like, of course I'm saved because God, you know, God saved me because I put my faith in Jesus Christ, not because of my own works. So guess what? I can't lose my salvation if I tried. And when you understand that, it's just so, uh, it's so enlightening and so, uh, you know, so much of a weight off of your, uh, that's when you understand these things. All right. So a way, the way of salvation can be summed up like this. From the, from the book of John. I know we went all over the place, but I'm just backing up what he's saying there in John. It can be summarized like this. Number one, the knowledge of the truth. 
Okay, you got the Word of God, and then it's spoken to man, and then he has that knowledge of, uh, you have that knowledge of the truth. Okay, then you put your faith in what you know. You put your faith in that knowledge, and then the new birth is given by the grace of God. The new birth is an inner birth, a spiritual birth. It's not talking about your physical body, but a, a spiritual birth. So knowledge of the truth, faith in that truth, and then a new birth by the grace of God. And that's why one last verse, go to first, I mean, go to John 1 again. And I don't have this marked, but but we'll find it real quick. Verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. All right, this is what we need. We need the grace of God or else we could never be saved. And so it's only by His grace, we certainly don't deserve it by our own actions, but it's by His grace that He sent us His the, the Word. Now, by receiving the knowledge of the Word, you know, that it, truth, if you will, by receiving that truth, we're saved by His grace. Okay, knowledge of the truth, faith in that, word, in that truth, and the new birth by the grace of God. I'm going to give you the three C's again so you can remember it. Number one is communication. Okay, Jesus was the Word. Number two is the creation. Jesus is the life. And number three is comprehension. Jesus is the light. Father, we thank you for your Word. And I thank you uh, sometimes for the clarity. Complicated sometimes even with my words. Uh, but Father, I pray that through the, through the hearts of faith and through the eyes of uh, uh uh, of the, of the spirit, uh, spiritual man, I pray that you help us to just comprehend these things, understand these things, give us grace and understanding and knowledge. Uh, and I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified with this work as we try to grow in your word and we try to know what you have uh, for us. And as we go out and take that gospel, uh, f the, the free gift of salvation to all those that believe, and we take that to the world, Lord, I pray that you'll bless those efforts I pray that you be glorified, and I pray that you would open up the eyes of men who are in spiritual blindness and spiritual darkness, and uh, you would make known that light, Lord, so that you'd give them life, eternal life that you've promised. And we thank you for it, and thank you for our salvation. Uh, bless the rest of the afternoon, the soul winning, and, and all that follows in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.